Okay, so um, here's the second video for day two. Um, just a reminder, if you don't already have uh, somewhere to take notes, you probably want that. Um, and I'm gonna be giving a little mini lecture review on unit three. Um, so this was on cell communication. And we started this unit by talking about signal transduction. If you remember, there are three steps. Um, first, we start with reception. This is when the um, signal is received by a cell. Then transduction. This is how that signal is um, amplified or passed through the cell to get to eventually some sort of response. Often the response would be a change in gene expression. So the response has something to do with the um, DNA, either like a gene being turned on or turned off, um, but not always. The response could be something else, some, um, something else happening within the cell. Um, and again, this whole unit had to do with cell communication. So what we spent a lot of the unit doing was looking at different examples of instances when cells would want to communicate. Um, but we kept coming back to this concept of signal transduction because um, this is fundamentally how all of that communication then is possible. Um, at its most general, right, there's lots of different reasons why cells might communicate, but at its most general, this is the main way that is happening. The only exception would be if the um, signaling molecule or the ligand, as we sometimes call it, if that is able to go through the cell membrane. So for example, if it's a small nonpolar molecule, then it might look a little different. But otherwise, a lot of the different types of cellular um, communication that we talked about would follow this same model. So um, one of the examples that we looked at was we looked at hormones a whole bunch and specifically as they related to homeostasis. So here was one example that we looked at of homeostasis. This has to do with um, insulin and glucagon, which are related to diabetes and regulating blood sugar. So diabetes is where the regulation of blood sugar is off because these hormones aren't being produced um, in accurate amounts or at all, or they aren't being um, the receptor for the signal um, when it's being received at the very beginning of the signal transduction pathway. There's something going wrong with that. So remember homeostasis is the idea that there's some set point that the body is trying to maintain. And so in this case, the way the body does that is it's trying to maintain the set blood glucose level if the blood glucose level rises, then the pancreas releases insulin to cause um, the blood to get taken in, or sorry, the glucose to get taken in from the blood into cells. So it comes out of the blood into the liver, for example. That means that then the blood glucose level goes down and we return to homeostasis. If the blood glucose level falls, you haven't eaten in a long time, then the pancreas um, produces glucagon. That glucagon tells cells, for example, in your liver, we need to release glucose into the blood. The glucose is released into the blood and we return to homeostasis. So you can imagine there are a lot of different ways this could go wrong, right? Because we're trying to maintain a pretty precise um, blood glucose level here. And if the hormones are even slightly out of whack, we have an issue. And remember also, we talked it during this part of the unit about feedback loops, and this would be an example of a negative feedback loop that we're trying, that we're finding this balance. If something goes up, then we bring it down. If something goes down, we bring it up. Um, and we did our homeostasis mini lab where you were using um, the little dropper, the little pipettes to try to get your color to be the exact right color, not to overshoot it and turn it blue, not to undershoot it, turn it yellow, but to have it be precisely at that green color. Um, then we did our micropipetting and ELISA lab um, and Props to Joseph, photo credit here. He made this lovely little micro pipetting image. Um, and with the Eliza lab, remember you were looking at 
the immune system. And this would be a really key time that the cells are communicating inside of the body in a very precise way. And so we applied that by doing an ELISA lab. And um, remember, an ELISA lab is all about antibodies and antibodies binding. Um, and that is actually a really, you might be hearing that come up right now with COVID-19. Antibodies are definitely being talked about. So it's an interesting thing to uh, have learned about this year. And then the immune system. So um, just a little bit very tiny reminder about the immune system. So remember that there are multiple parts of your immune system, but the cellular communication part all comes down to how the helper T cells are coordinating the rest of your immune system to have this specific response to a specific pathogen. So the helper T cell is alerted of some specific antigen that the pathogen has. The pathogen would be like the virus or the bacteria. And because it knows that there's this specific marker on that virus or bacteria, um, the marker we call an antigen, because it knows exactly what that shape of the antigen is, it can then use cellular communication processes to tell the cytotoxic T cells, to tell the B cells, this is precisely the shape of this antigen, which means that then the B cells and the cytotoxic T cells can then have a very specific response, searching to kill, destroy, et cetera, that specific pathogen by looking for that specific shaped an antigen. And remember that also is what helps produce your memory cells, which then um, give you that immunity later. Um, we don't entirely understand how that works yet for coronavirus, but um, there's some understanding, there's some thought that um, this is happening with people who have had coronavirus and recovered, that they, um, or had COVID-19 and then recovered, that they have immunity because of their memory cells. And that was Unit 3. Unit 3, if you remember, um, was much more with practice with doing diagram analysis. So a lot more of the like more skills based work than it was content. Um, but I do have a little surprise. Look at what I found when I was looking up Unit 3. I found all of these lovely photos of you guys. I'm sorry I don't have quite everyone's photo. I can find not quite everyone's, but I thought this is a lovely little surprise. And I included a screenshot here in case the other one um, doesn't load well for you. But I thought that was pretty cute one to share with you all. Just a little smile. Um, and then what is due on Friday, April 10th at 11.59 p.m.? So after you've watched this, hopefully then you come to the Zoom session at 1.30, but um, what is actually due on Friday at 11.59 p.m.? is the three for response questions that I've included here in this Google Doc that's posted to Google Classroom. So what I did was I took these three free response questions, but I broke them up into multiple parts. So for example, here's one. This is just one question, but I'm gonna have you answer four separate questions. So you are answering everything in blue because I want to guide you through thinking how would, what are the various things you have to think about when you approach a free response question? Um, so you see that like broken out and then those together help you answer this question. Um, and you'll see it's all laid out for you. So the black font is from College Board. Blue is what I want you to actually answer. And purple are some tips and instructions from me. I think you'll be able to figure it out. Just do your best. Um, and I look forward to seeing what you guys come up with. I'm hoping this can be a little bit of practice for a free response since we all know we need to work on that a whole bunch. Okay. Um, good luck. And hopefully I see you guys soon at our Zoom. Bye, guys.